Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome you to the Revolutionize Retirement interview with expert series. First of all, I'm Dory Mincer, your host and owner of Revolutionize Retirement. And let me just get on to the program now and welcome Abigail Trafford, who's an author, journalist, and public speaker. And she focuses on this new stage of life that comes after middle age and before traditional old age. Her book, My Time, Making the Most of the Bonus Decades After 50, chronicles the social revolution of living longer and healthier lives. As Time Goes By explores the new rules for relationships in this very uncharted period. Her Washington Post column, she discusses the potential and the problems of longevity for both individuals, couples, and society. She also gave a keynote address at the White House Conference on Aging. For 14 years, she was the health educator of the Washington Post and has covered a range of stories from the landings on the moon to the politics of abortion. She's also author of another book called Crazy Time, Surviving Divorce and Building a New Life. Uh, Abby's a graduate of Bryn Mawr College and received a journalism fellowship at the Harvard School of Public Health and was a visiting scholar at the Stanford Center on Longevity. She lives in Boston, Mass., and Vinyl Haven, Maine. And I've had the opportunity to meet Abby both in person and also to have interviewed her before. And I can just tell you that it's, she has a wealth of information to share about really this incredible stage of life that I think everybody on the call is part of. So I want to start now and really welcome you. I'm delighted to have you with us. And can you maybe start out, Abby, and tell us a little of how you got interested in the field of longevity? Absolutely, and I'm so glad to be here and be with you. As health editor of the Washington Post, I was asked every year, what's the big story? And we would have big stories. We had transplants, we had gene therapy, we had transplants. But the biggest story was the unnoticed story, and that was every year we got healthier at older ages. It wasn't just that we were adding years under the end of life. What we were doing is inserting healthy years before the end of life. And this, there's a huge decline in disabilities, a huge increase in really health functioning. It's not that we don't have illnesses, but our functioning well-being is just much greater than it was in our grandparents' period. So this really interested me, and so I started going out and talking to people and put together, it seemed like this is an amazing story, that we have embarked on a total social revolution. For the first time, really, in, in any human history, we, as a generation, have these bonus decades. And the research shows that what we've done is gained 10 biological years on average. That means it's not like they say that 60 is the new 30, but the concept is right, that on average for the population, 60 is really what is 50 in our grandparents' uh, era. And we all know about averages that it varies. So for some people, it's, you are much younger, and some people with real disabilities are older. But it's that biological bonus, that extra 10, and that has changed the landscape. That changes what we do, our work life. It changes families. It changes all of our relationships. The, the, the challenge is, what do you do with these bonus decades? No longer can you think, I'm looking to retirement, maybe I'll take a trip and I'll take some watercolors and we'll have a nice time and see the grandchildren. It's You're talking about maybe 10, 20, 30 years. This is a whole lifetime in generations past. And I think people now are saying, I not only have to confront the challenges that come at this stage, I call them jolts in the book, but I also have to create a new life for myself. What's my purpose? What do I care about? Who am I going with? And I think that this is exciting, but it's also very challenging for all of us because it's new. We're the pioneers. There's no, there are no real answers. There are not a lot of role models. We are the ones who are since setting the course for our children and grandchildren. 
You're so right. And it's, it is a new course. And I actually, in line with that, I have a question already from that I want to just ask sure. from Elizabeth in uh, Maryland, who says, where do you think the best place is to begin researching this emerging developmental period that you're talking about? You mentioned about the research, but do you have a sense of where should where is the yes. best place to begin? Or I think there are several places, and you really need to put it together. Stanford has a really great center on longevity. It's run by Laura Carstensen. And they do a lot of research, particularly in the nuts and bolts of an older generation. And so there's a lot of activity there. The International Longevity Center was founded by Robert Butler, who really, I think, is the godfather of the longevity movement. And he was the founding director of the National Institute on Aging. And his center really explored all the different aspects of having older populations around the world. Again, we're focused on the United States, but this phenomenon is happening around the world. And that's a good place. I think the the International Center is now under Columbia University. Mm -hmm. And then there are organizations that that look at pieces of it, not the whole – it's not a holistic view, but pieces of it. For instance, Civic Ventures based in San Francisco with Mark Friedman, that looks at purpose. What are you going to do with these years? And a lot of it, because as we, as we know, psychologically we get into what Eric Erickson called the generative period, that feeling of wanting to give of ourselves to others. And I think that Civic Ventures there has, has wonderful uh, programs and experts who are there around that piece of it, which is finding purpose, doing work, the whole thing of encore jobs. Uh, there are other organizations, for example, in the National Council on Aging with James Furman, that's based in Washington, and that organization does a lot about the statistics and policies and trends that are going on in this in this age group. Of course, it's AARP, and they have a, they they certainly have a lot of work on that. But those are just some of the organizations and institutions that, in a sense, have realized, hey, we're in the midst of a revolution, but it's a soft revolution. No one's throwing firecrackers in the streets. But it's a huge revolution, and it's going on, and we have to understand it, and we have to get our hands around it. And there's some perils. There's some real challenges. People can get really lost and churned up by this. There is this great potential of renaissance. But to get, as they say in Maine, from here to there, it takes it takes a lot of understanding. It takes work. It takes some luck. It, but I believe that if you understand that what you're going through is it's not all – individual, you really are part of something larger, then that helps you find resources in which to get through some of these problems. Absolutely. And can, maybe you could elaborate. Why do you think people get in trouble in this stage of life? What is it that kind of gets in the way? I think some of it is they deny that it's happening. I think denial and certainly, you say the word aging and everybody just wants to to go away. In other words, we really are focused on youth and in staying young and we think of adjectives with young of being vital and hot and on it and with it. And so if you say old, people say, no, I'm not going to go there. So the first thing that happens is that people say, no, I'm not old. You can be 60 or 70 or 80 and you say, no, 50, no, I'm not old. And what that does does is it prevents you from, in a sense, making that leap, that transition from what I call conventional adulthood to this new stage of life. And what do I mean by conventional adulthood? It's that we've completed the adult tasks. We've raised our children. We've earned a living. We've been out there in the workplace. We've made friends. We've made marriages and families. And then what? We're only halfway through. And they, we have this mm-hmm. gift of time. But as James Furman says, we're lost as a generation. We don't know what to do with this gift of time. So I think that's part of it. Then what also happens, when I'm saying when you get around 50, is you get jolts. And these often these are jolts of loss. And some of those jolts are very normal. It's your kids grow up and go away, go off. They go off to college or they go off and make their own lives and they're not in the house. So that task of raising a a child to 18 is done. We get jolts at work. 
we may burn out on the job and just can't just feel as though we're slogging along. We may, our, where we work may be reorganized. We may be pushed out. We uh, may lose our job. We may want to go to another job, but we get some jolts in the workplace. We get jolts in personal lives. Uh, I think that after we get to be a certain age, we notice the obituaries. If people die who we've cared about, I mean, people in our families, uh, our parents, or our mentors, and suddenly we're very aware that, that it's a paradox. We get an urgency that time is limited. We're in that zone. So we have this gift of time, but we're also very aware that it's going to has an end point. And so we lose people that we love. And certainly marriages go through major changes and divorce and widowhood becomes much more of a reality at this stage. So all of these are jolts. And what are jolts? Jolts are signals that one chapter in life is ending and another one is going to begin. And in a way, that's a very important transition because when I go around and talk to people, they say that as horrible as these jolts are, that sometimes the jolts, there's a liberation in the jolts. And I'll give you an example. The wonderful researcher, Silver, of a New England Centennial study, and she talks about how when she was young, she was very competitive and ambitious, as most of us are, and she would play tennis, but she wasn't very good at tennis, so she stopped playing tennis because it wasn't fun. She didn't, wasn't very good at it. But then she says after 50 or whatever, she found she really likes to play a game of tennis, and so she picked up tennis again, and she plays tennis, and she says the difference is I'm still not very good at tennis. But I enjoy the game, and that's why I'm playing tennis. So that's the kind of a, an evolution of sort of the, our inner psychological drive that changes here to a much more, I would say, much more accepting, more open place where you can do things and enjoy them, and it's not always that sort of competitive ambitiousness that we associate with youth. And that's a good liberation. That's a very good liberation. And it, it makes so much sense because often I think what I've found too in my work is that people begin to shift from giving so much power to the outside to really listening more to what the priorities are and what's coming from inside. And I think you're your example is a great one about that. Oh, Are there absolutely. other examples of how people maybe can transform this, these jolts or the losses and regenerate and, and, and free up their lives? Oh, yes. I think in, in the book I have a lot of examples. What was inspiring to me in talking to people is how generous and big-hearted people are in, in confronting terrible losses, the loss of deaths of spouses and children mm. and really and, and major health issues, but that getting through that and getting on to, in a sense, what they would call their my time, a new life, which usually involved – new purpose, and new love. And by that, I'm not saying another partner. I'm saying really opening up oneself to other people and stronger relationships with friends, with other family members, with just this, with others. There's this opening up. I quote a woman in the book who said, I, and she had, she did, she lost her husband and, and lost her son in a, in, a, in a plane crash. And she said, nothing can stop me now. I, and her advice was, whatever, just do it. I, when you've seen the, the blackest of darkness, you then, in a sense, can turn around and see the light. And she actually became a very good photographer. And I think that this idea of regeneration is really important. And that's exactly what happens in my time. Exactly what we're going through is it's a regeneration. But you can't keep plowing the same field. That chapter is over. And so it's a, it's a question of really evolving into a new path. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little more, too? I know, and I know from your book, which I just want to 
put a plug in for Abigail's book because it's really terrific and I recommend it. You specifically say my time rather than me time, and I love that distinction. I wonder if right, you could, absolutely. You know, this is not, actually this that. is an, yeah. this is the opposite of a me time, but it is yeah. a my time yeah. in that it's up to each of us to carve a path, and there are many paths. In previous stages, it's scripted. You have to go to you have to be a junior in high school, and then you go on and do this, and you have your first job, and you have a child, and you do this. And nothing is scripted now. Yeah, you mm-hmm. make your own script, so it really is my time. It's also, in previous stages, I think of it as their time. It was your boss's time, the teacher's time, your parents' time, your children's time, and whatever happened to my time. And that's why I call this my time. And it goes back to I had there was a reunion at my college, which is an all women's college. And I think we were 10 years out and we were all coming back and we were gung ho jobs. We were breaking barriers as a woman. We had husbands. We had children. We wanted to do it all. And frankly, we were all really exhausted. (laughs) And a classmate stood up and said, when is it going to be my time? And that stuck Mm -hmm. with me. And the answer Mm -hmm. is, my time comes when we've completed those adult tasks. And then what? And the field is wide open. And that has great promise and potential, but it's also a little scary. Because for the first time in society, we don't have scripted roles. It's just, it's, it's, as I say, new road, no rules. We, Mm -hmm. and, and as the first generation, we're carving out the different paths. And I, it's helpful, I think, to um, put this in perspective. And let's talk about adolescence, which is also a transition period. The word didn't come in, didn't exist until 1904 when it was introduced by G. Stanley Hall. And he wrote this tome about adolescence being a transition from childhood to adulthood. But that time, life expectancy from birth was about, was less than 50 we it, 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 but it had gotten longer than 35 or whatever so there was enough time to have a new stage in the life cycle that we call adolescence inserted in between childhood and adulthood and i think a similar thing is happening now that we have enough time between conventional adulthood and really old age uh, for a new stage to be inserted in the life cycle And it's very exciting. We just don't know exactly what it's all about because we are living it. And I think it's pretty exciting. And we don't know exactly what it's going to be like. I like to see, to make an analogy with adolescence, though, and look back in adolescence, what happens in adolescence. And first of all, it's a transition. It's got a lot of tumult. It's got a lot of uncertainty. One of the things that we have in common my time is really starting out having common with teenagers, is empowerment. Uh, teenagers have physical empowerment. They're suddenly as big and strong as their parents, and, it's, and so it's physical empowerment. But what we have is life empowerment. We have really learned a lot in our lives so that when we come to this stage, we bring to it a great deal of expertise. We, 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 we don't realize really how, how much we know and how much power we have simply because we have completed the ad- adult task. Another, I love that concept. Of, I just want to underscore that I, the, the, that notion of life empowerment and that wisdom and perspective in contrast to the kind of physical or hormonal empowerment of teenagers. Exactly. Really like exactly. When I say this is like a second adolescence, we're not like teenagers. Mm-hmm. We're much nicer and smarter and wiser <laughs> and all of that. But the other thing that, that teenagers do is what I call dreaming. And that is they don't know what they're going to be when they grow up. They One day they want to be an astronaut, the next day a policeman, the next day a dancer, the next day uh, a banker, the next day they want to stay in bed all day and read. And we give them lots of space on this. We have our whole education system is geared to giving them opportunities to explore different avenues. And we have camps, we have internships and fellowships, and we send them on trips. And they and it's all, in a sense, this dreaming, imagining what life might be like to be fill-in-the-blank. 
in a way, that's what we need to go through, too, that when we say goodbye to one stage in life and we don't know where we're going in another one, why don't we take a little time out and do some dreaming? And people doing this naturally, they will sign up for courses. They will jobs in their community, serving their community. They will maybe go on trips and discover different places. There's this yearning to experience different parts of life. And I think that dreaming is really essential because it's out of this dreaming that people say, now this is how I'm going to focus. And the focusing is where you build your legacy. And your legacy is the traces of who you are, what you know. They can be physical legacies like handing down a family Bible or building a clinic for a clinic for people who are having a hard time or out of work. You or to and also the second part I call I call them the L's, the three L's, learning and legacy and love. I think that love then takes priority in these stage in a way. We look at ourselves and we look at the people around us and we say what is love all about? What is caring for someone else all about? What is sharing my life all about? And I think these are very important questions for people in my time. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think so. And I think part of the difference, too, as I was thinking, listening to you, is also in the second adulthood, as you're talking about it, we also have a sense of time in a different way. We know we don't have forever. And right. And... I guess the dilemma I often see with people is sometimes people then say, give up. And But you're saying dream and recognize that there's never been a generation that has had these extra years. And it's exactly. not now when. Gene Cohen right. used to always Absolutely. say that. It's not now right. when. What are they going to do to right. me? It's right. a, there's a great deal of intervention and creativity mm-hmm. that's possible because there there are no rules. And it's a great quest, in a sense, to answer these very essential questions about life. And now you get a real chance to do it. You've got the time, but you're absolutely right. It's the paradox of time. You have more time. You have these bonus decades, but you also know it could end any moment. There's an urgency. For instance, we have that, say, teenagers and adolescents don't have that. They think they're immortal. They're going to live forever. But we know differently. We're in the shadow. So that sort of makes everything a lot more important. I think one of the keys, people say, what are the five tips to having a great, to living gracefully? And we've all heard about diet and exercise and all of that. But probably the key is relationships. That that turns out to be the, probably the essential key to how you thrive in these in this time. And there's one concept that I like very much is the concept of our intimate circle. Um, Can you and, speak more about that? Because I, I think it's a great concept. Yeah. The concept of the intimate circle is people that you can't imagine your life without. That you can fill in the blank. It, it obviously can include a spouse, it can include a parent, a child, a grandchild, a friend, a neighbor. It's up to you to decide what that, what, who is in your circle. And this is research by Laura Carsonson at the Stanford Center on Longevity. It turns out you need about eight to ten people in your circle to really thrive in this stage. If you get below three, it's like you get failure to thrive syndrome. It's like well, sometimes infants get. And I think that is really interesting. And it, it calls, sometimes married couples can be very isolated, and that is not healthy. And certainly marriage and partnership is a key part of the circle, but it's not the only part of the circle. And what I also found is a great deal of range and imaginative ways of having friendships and having closeness. And I think that's something that that's within all of our power to to build our intimate circle. It has nothing to do with what your level of education or socioeconomic status or even health status. What it has to do with how do you bond and make connections with others. And if you eight to ten people doesn't sound like a lot, but that's really, that's your team. And I think that's very important, and especially in this chapter. 
Yeah, I have a, there's a question from another listener, Tom from Texas, who says, I think it ties into this, and I, I want us to be able to talk more about this notion of intimate circle, but he wonders, what advice would you give to single seniors who may choose to relocate and start over in creating a new community of friends and neighbors? So what advice for people who perhaps are don't have or maybe feel like they have to begin and not carry over people from the past, although I hear that that maybe it doesn't have to be an either or, but I'd love your thoughts on that. I, it's not an either or. I think how as a single person in this stage do you recreate, do you create, yeah, do you regenerate, do you create a new life? And what part of that is moving geographically? And I think there's no up or down answer to that because what the real answer is where are you moving and why? A lot of people move to a nicer climate and to be closer to their adult children. That's, but that's all fine. But again, the key issue, I think, is uh, what about your intimate circle? There, I think people in your intimate circle are too precious just to say, I'll get another intimate circle. You certainly can, and you certainly can make new friendships and have new love partners in this stage. But I think when you think about moving, and, quote, starting over, you have to be a little wise about it and see why are you moving and what not just what the climate is, but what, in a sense, the relational climate is because you do need you need friends. Friendship really becomes a bedrock, I think, in this stage. And there is something about people who have known you through different phases of your life that's very precious. It's why... People love to go back to reunions and to see people who knew you when before, in a sense, before you you became who you are. And also in romance, one of the big themes of romance in this stage is what I call the throwback couple. And I write about this, and as time goes by, there's, there's a lot of meeting again someone you knew in your past, and that prov- that seems to be an incredibly strong aphrodisiac. So in answer to your question, I'm dodging it because I think there's so much that depends on it. I think the impulse to start anew and have a new chapter is terrific because that's, in a sense, what we all have to do. I think you have to be careful that you aren't, in a sense, going making a huge leap where you cut yourself off from people who are really important to you. But you don't have to. Often you can move and you keep your circle. You amend your circle, but you have your circle. That's The research shows that these intimate circles are very stable over time. And so you can keep your circle. And well, the other, the I other guess that's that, my answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and what I was going to say the other part that's related to that, I think, now is there's so many changes that have happened in technology that even with moving, one can maintain connections with people yes. either on the phone or their conference lines or being able to see each other, which didn't exist in the past. So that no, there's no. just a different way of being connected. Yeah. And then the other thing to realize is you don't make one decision that this process of regeneration goes on it continues to go on so let's say you make a move and it doesn't work out that's okay let's make then go back to that analogy with teenagers if a teenager calls them and says i can't stand the car this camp i got bitten by a snake i want to go home i can't stand it or after it's all over says that was the worst experience i ever had i can't bear it we take that in stride we figure some things are going to work out and some things are not going to work out in a way that's true of us in this stage some things are going to work out and some things might not work out and you can always amend it's not nothing is quite mm-hmm. so written in stone we come out of conventional adulthood where to successfully navigate through adulthood you make to-do lists and you check it off and you have a pretty definite path and you're much you're very rational about it whereas i think in this stage you have to say loosen up and say okay maybe this is part dreaming and for part of dreaming i'm going to go live in australia for a year they've asked me to be a teacher in a school there and i'm just going to try it out i'm single i it's time for just a complete fresh 
experience. And that's great. I do write about people in the book who, there was a good story of one woman and I think her her husband had died. They just got, they got divorced and she was single and her children are all had their families and were busy and certainly didn't want mopey mom around and, or mopey dad. But if she got interested in ethics and she got a, a chance to go to Rome for a semester to study ethics. And and she decided to do it. And so there's a wonderful scene at the airport where her son, her adult son, is driving her to the airport and he's on the plane. And then her son says, don't worry, Mom, if you don't like it, you can always come home. This is a wonderful generation switch. It was just what a parent would say to a young child. I think that there's a lot more loosening up of this stage and that when we make decisions, it's it's not written in stone, and we all make mistakes at different times of our life, and we have to be good to each other. I think that's another theme, is that if you finally just accept yourself as, as a lovable, wonderful human being, and yes, you have flaws, and you make some mistakes, that makes you human. The worst thing, I think, is to be afraid, afraid of change, afraid of doing anything, and that's what I call the shutdown. You just shut down and get paralyzed, and several generations back, you could do that. You'd get to be, you get to this stage, and chances are you weren't going to live much longer. But now that's changed, and that's both the challenge as well as the opportunity of having these bonus decades really important. Can can you talk more, too, about really how love fits? You mentioned the three L's of learning, legacy, and love. And can you talk more, and I know as time goes by, as much more about love and relationships and marriage and and romance, but what are you finding happening among couples? I know there's long-term relationships. There's new relationships. What's your experience of what happens and what changes and what's does work or doesn't work right. for people. Well, the, the, the exciting part of this is that there's a whole sort of sub-revolution going on, which is which has to do with love and romance, and that people in this stage are creating a, new ways of love and romance and relationships. Let's take long-standing marriages. In a, one person said to me, I've had six marriages all to the same person. And I thought that was really wise in a way. It's a way to say that what enlivens marriage and um, makes marriage really work is to have different chapters in the marriage, which essentially are different kinds of relationships. And the challenge for people who are married, in a sense, is to work through that transition. And often it's around retirement. And Phyllis Moen is a researcher, and she's at the University of Minnesota, and she studied what happens to couples around retirement. And and the the data suggests that for two years, it's a very tricky situation. And the most critical period is when a husband retires and the wife continues to work. There's a great deal of stress going on. And so I think that's one of the hurdles for couples. Another hurdle for couples is that they break up that you are seeing sort of an uptick anecdotally among couples who are married who get divorced or who don't live with each other, who decide that they're going to have separate destinies in this stage. And you also have people who lose their spouse to death and are single. And several things happen here. One is singlehood is, for a lot of people, turns out to be great. It's a, it's not what it used to be. Oh, it's a couple's world. You really need a partner. So it turns out that the demographic landscape has changed a lot in that sense. And being single is a lot. Some research suggests that some of the happiest people in the world are people in their 70s who are single and who have friends. And friendship comes in. And that brings me to, again, we have to remember the concept of the intimate circle, but also in romance and partnerships, certainly people are remarrying and they're also re, they're re-cohabitating without marriage and they also have relationships. They're travel partners or they'll see each other on weekend partners or movie partners. And so there's a lot of churn that's going on. And I remember a situation, and it was around Thanksgiving, 
where a friend called and she was just tearing her hair. She was in her 40s and I guess her children were beginning teenagers. And she had a situation where her mother-in-law, her mother-in-law had recently lost her husband and she wanted to come with her new boyfriend. And it had her father who was also single and he wanted to come with his girlfriend and she said here we are a family with the teenage children she said one what do i tell the children about this about their grandparents and two where are they all going to sleep and who cuts the turkey and it's like the older generation in some ways is the rebellious shocking generation to the, the middle adult generation which is the staid generation if there's been a generational flip and a lot of that is because people in this stage see possibilities that really weren't there before. Right. And I think many more people are saying, I don't want to stay in a bad relationship. If, Absolutely. And, you know, and if was, I'm going to have 30 or 40 more years. <laughs> exactly right. And I write quite a lot about that in, as time goes by. And you know, There was a Pew Research study that showed that the majority of people – believe people should be able to get out of a marriage if they're not mutually happy together. And that's a, it was a larger proportion than people asked the same question if there were small children in the house. So, there's a, again, there's this general loosening up, and this issue of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, in a sense, is really comes front and center of relationships in this period, because why would you be together other for the, the caring and love and enjoyment of the other? There's been a lot of work on, or discussion, I think, of John Gottman on the issue of play and pleasure. And earlier marriages, or marriages of just a few years, they often break up because of conflict. But I think other marriages in this stage of life, it's often because people are just have burnout and they've already in a sense separated their interests from each other already and it's we really do have different destinies maybe you want to go up get a cabin in the mountains and go fishing and i want to live in the city or they just and people work that out or they take a break from each other but say one of the partners has a chance, I don't know, for six months to go to Mexico and be a guide or something. And people say, yes, they're just much more open. And I think there are landmines here, but this sort of shift to more of a companionate marriage and relationship is very prevalent in these years. And, and I think that raises a whole other host of quest issues and questions. Two things come to mind. One what I often say to people is even in the best of relationships, and it, I think it ties into your concept of this intimate circle, you can't rely on one person for everything, so we need other people. And it, I think it's more and more clear that we, it's important not to be attached at the hip so that people realize that whether you stay in a relationship or not, that have things that really give purpose and meaning to yourself, and, and it may not be shared by a partner. But That's the right. other part that just hit me as you were talking too, is that I could imagine people listening and thinking, that's all well and good if people have the finances to do all that. And this whole stage of life, it's money, but it's more than money. And I wondered if you could talk a little oh, about it's that. absolutely more too. than money. I think sometimes right. in the advertisements, we're focused on the magic number and how much money do you need. And, and this developmental process of going from conventional adulthood into my time, through the transition, and as I say, having a legacy, having love, learning. This process goes on. It's the same whether you're rich or poor. And I have some examples in my time, and as time goes by, of people who regenerate out of the jolts and regenerate to really productive, important lives after, afterwards. Now, of course, money is really important, and often money is a code for education and standard of living, and that's important at every stage of life, so you certainly can't minimize that. But generally, I think that this whole phenomenon is it, it transcends money and socioeconomic status. I describe one person, and she actually then she – she left her job and she became a minister in a small town and did not get very much pay, although she did get housing. And she put it together and she said, what I need is just enough. 
And I think that's the goal. And certainly we all need just enough. And health is another big right. issue. Most of us are healthy. And it's really interesting. A study came out and showed that older people, I think it was people over 80, were very rated themselves as in good to excellent health. And then they were asked to list the diseases they had. And it was heart disease and cancer and diabetes and arthritis. And so you would think if you looked at the list of diseases that these people would all be in a hospital. But here's that part of the revolution. They have these diseases, but they're functioning well and are are out there enjoying their lives and and rate themselves as being in good health. (laughs) And I think that's certainly important. A big jolt, and I talk about this a lot, and as time goes by, as well as my time, is when you lose a partner into death, and or the partner gets very sick or gets hijacked by Parkinson's or, or Alzheimer's. That's a whole other issue in relationships. And I describe that of how people confront those jolts and get through it. Again, I want to say it's your intimate circle that really is what embraces and sustains you. And that's why we need to work on our circles. I think it's so important, that notion of kind of this caring collaborative that we need. And the more and more people, there's people who outlive their children or outlive their spouses or never had children. And it's so important to think about who can we turn to and who will turn to us that we can count on as intimates. I just think it's such an important concept. And the How first step think, oh, is to be ahead. an intimate. Yeah. In other words, is right. to extend your friendship to others who are needing friendship. Mm-hmm. And that it's, I think people get frightened and they would say, yeah, my, I've lived longer than my children. I don't have my friends. I'm very alone. And what if though, and then you get frightened. That's just the, the way it's going to be. But we all can have, we can all build an intimate circle. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes focus. But I think that's really important. And friendship is so important. Psychiatrists told me that friendship is key, that often it extends the parenting you received as a child if it was good parenting. And so in a sense, you were always, you're always embraced in that way. Or it substitutes for bad parenting. It can make up for bad parenting. Mm-hmm. Friends also can sustain you and in a sense bear witness. It's that bear witnessing to your lives and what's really important in your life. And that's really, these are thrilling relationships. Mm-hmm. It makes me think back to the question that Tom from Texas raised and just even thinking about all the different housing options that have developed for our generation. I think more will be developing, and it is true that where we live can help in as a place or an opportunity to develop more of these intimate circles. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, just whether it be intentional communities or co-housing or multi-generational co-housing or continuing care retirement community, there are ways, even if have felt like bereft and feel like there aren't that many people from before, although there probably are if you let yourself explore it, but even if there aren't, many it's not too late to start to develop new friendships and i, I oh absolutely and and, and the co-housing yeah. movement is very strong right. there's also the village movement it was started right. in the beacon hill village move um, village yeah. and you have them throughout the country and this is to help people quote age in place but it's a community right. that with that offers a level of both uh, social interaction and and help you got to get the mm-hmm. drains fixed or you need to be taken to a doctor's right. appointment it's this sense that we belong to something larger than ourselves. It recreates that. It's really the ideology of the village. And I think there's a lot, there's a lot going on. One of the things is we have to realize that the power of numbers, we really are the dominant generation now of people who have been through conventional adulthood. And we have much to give and much to gain in this period. And and on the giving side, I think we have to think of ourselves as life philanthropists. Philanthropists make a lot of money in their life and then they give it back. Carnegie built all the libraries. We, in a sense, have it, but instead of money, most of us have, we have life experience. And I think that this is a great treasure. And as individuals, we need to 
give it away. But I also think as a society, and I would say in terms of uh, policy workers, we need to find ways to tap the potential of all of us who are so vital and have so much to give and can really help deal with a lot of the social problems we're facing right now in the country. And I think that's really important that you could, when we talk about, for instance, public works program, we really think of young people building bridges. But I think we could also think of older people building the social infrastructure of our communities. Mm -hmm. And it's wide open for leadership. It's wide open to entrepreneurs who want to develop organizations to do just that. And I think there is much more. There are just organizations that look at what next, what, and also organizations, traditional organizations like churches and community centers that have a community and are focused on this age group. Mm -hmm. Because we're very powerful and we have a lot to give. And we've got to break into what well, ageism. We have to break mm-hmm. into this culture when it's all about young people. And we have to watch our language. We've got to change the language. I would change the word retirement. If you're 65 years old and in good health, you're not going to retire. You can leave the company or the place where you've been working a long time or you might lose your job, but you're going to go on to something else. So retirement is a terrible word. There are others. The adverb still is a sneaky one. He's 70 and he still plays tennis. It's not still, he plays tennis. Or look at that cute couple in the corner. They're 80 and they're still holding hands. There's a great deal of, that's, they're holding hands because mm. they really have a vast spark between each other. So we have a cultural challenge, which is to change the image of getting older. And I think our legacy to younger generations is to show them not to fear aging, not to fear getting older, and to show them how to love in these decades, because I think that's a that's an essential key, and we do it with the model of our lives, and we do it just changing their mindset, and we can do that. Just look how that's possible. And so I look forward to a much better, richer life for older people in the future. Mm -hmm. Let me digress for a moment because there's another question now from Sylvia who says, um, if one is chronically sick like with Parkinson's and you want to have a life, i.e. my time, what suggestions do you have on how to reconcile a not-so-good marriage now that one needs care and how or why to stay involved? intimate circle that certainly your partner is chronically ill and that changes the dynamic and the relationship but the first thing is certainly to keep open and keep building and being part of your intimate circle so it's not your whole emotional life is not defined by the other person and I would say vice versa for the person who is sick secondly is that illness has a way of changing the power relationships, for lack of a better word, between two people. And that actually can be very exciting for people. Sometimes couples get into a rut as to who makes the decisions or who doesn't, who's the dominant one, who's who goes along. who. And now with an illness, that all changes. And sometimes that can be changed for much the better and that people find an opening to come closer together and to realize the preciousness of each other. It's not always, there's no guarantees with this, but I think that knowing that your relationship with someone who is chronically ill and failing is going is is in the midst of huge change that it's not just preserving the relationship you had before except that you have all the, the sickness in in it i think that's important and i think it's important to talk about it part of it is grieving loss this is a mm-hmm. loss and i think it can be really hard and there's been a lot of research done on that on the care of the caretaker and what the mm-hmm. caretaker needs needs certainly needs breaks and for some people, there is a, a reckoning that people get closer. Mm-hmm. 
in marriage mm-hmm. and also in, 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 in other relationships. I know of a, a family in which the, the father had been fairly dogmatic and, and, um, and controlling and always right and um, it suffered um, some brain deterioration, some dementia, which actually made it much easier for his family members, for his children, that, that, that there was a mellowing. And so in a sense, the family became much closer. So you don't know exactly how the disease, the disorder is going to affect the person and change the relationship. But I think it's one of the issues that, that we haven't, we don't really know how to, how to deal with the taking care of chronically ill people and to sustain relationships and keep oneself in a good place emotionally and relationally. And I guess I end with where I started is that's your intimate circle. No, I really want to underscore that too because I think we will be seeing more and more of the chronic or people having long-term terminal illnesses because now with medical advances, people can be living for a long time with things that would have maybe within a year or so killed them. And I think it, the, it, the dynamics change, and it becomes important to think about both who can you turn to for help, but also if as much as possible using some of the respite uh, situations because people do need time apart and time away, yeah. particularly if you're in that caregiving role. I just want to underscore that. Yes, I think the risk of isolation at this phase right. is really high, and that, that's right. not good. Another a comment, and it's, it, it's something I am aware of, and I don't know if you are, but I think it, I'm glad that Bill from Houston has mentioned it, and you may be also aware of it, Abby, that There is a Creative Retirement Exploration Weekend that I think is annual in Asheville offered by the University of North Carolina. And I think that it's coming up in the next, I think it's springtime, but I'm not sure. I don't want to say the wrong date, but I think it's, I've heard wonderful things about it. I've never participated in it, but do you know about it? And I think it's something good for people to know about. Yeah. I I have not participated in it, but I've heard about it. And I think there are lots, there are conferences that come up and I think I'm trying to think Mm -hmm. of the OSHA organization also puts on conferences in the various words, positive aging, creative retirement. And I think it's all, I think they're all very good. One of the, one of the things Mm -hmm. that's good is you meet people who are in a sense going through similar things that you are. And there's the potential to find, to add to your intimate circle as well. And, Mm -hmm. and to know that you're not alone. I think that's a very important and some specific pointers. Like you want to get another job. You need to earn a certain amount of income. And how do you go about doing that? How do you, what are there? Some there are also meetings where there's very specific advice, and I think they're very important. Mm-hmm. Another organization that I'm aware of that that I think can be very helpful for people is called the, the International Saging Guild. There's oh, a, yes. a focus yes. on really helping people. I've actually become a member of that and went to a conference last October and. It brings together both professionals but just public, and it's got a spiritual event. But a part of the notion is that in our particular society, elders tend not to be revered. And so there's this whole notion about thinking about yourself in a different way where you value yourself and the wisdom you have as an elder. And it's joining together. It's another, I think, lovely organization, too, that I would encourage people to learn about if you don't know about it. Absolutely. Other organizations, you have the Transition Network, right. and that's a yeah. membership organization of uh, midlife women in transition. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. based in New York, but they, but, they, but they also have chapters in San Francisco and Houston, Denver, Chicago, Washington, and Boston. Boston just started one, yeah. Boston just started one, which is good. You have Project Renewment. Which is really right. based in Los Angeles. But again, there, there are chapters around where it's people meeting together and it's based on Helen Dennis and Bernice Bratner's work. Exactly, yes. Where there are little groups that come together and talk and it can be ways to begin to develop your intimate circles too. And the transition right. network too, even if there's not a chapter where you live, I know there are people calling in from all over. You can become a member and they have peer support groups on the phone. Exactly. So that you don't even exactly. have to live where there's a chapter. So there's so many 
ways that are helping people connect with each other, which I think underscores what you've been talking about, Abby. And I think we have to be a model. We have to show, I call it swagger. We have to get a swagger about being in my time. We have to get a swagger about saying we're a life philanthropist. And and we have to use that swagger instead of, instead of trying to make excuses like we're old, we don't run as fast. We have to say, we're pretty sensational here. We have survived a long time, and we know a lot. And we know a lot both technically, and we know a lot spiritually, and we know a lot in terms of relationships, and we can make the world a better place. And mm-hmm. we also want some respect here. I think the great thing which we... I'm reminded of a young woman I met who she was in her 30s and she was a, she was and she had older brothers or whatever and she turned to me and she said you won't believe what my parents are doing and I said oh well, tell me what your parents are doing the story it turned out she said you know what they sold the house they put the furniture in storage and announced that they were just going to drive around the country for six months and she said you don't know how odd it is for your parents not to have a permanent address. And she went on saying, gosh, we're all upset about this. And so I said, tell me more. And then she said, her father had a business which he had sold, and her mother worked in municipal government, and there was a change in administration. They had each been diagnosed with a cancer and been treated and had a good prognosis. At this point, I could say, yeah, they're confronted. They've had all these jolts of health, jolts of work, jolts in themselves, and they said, we need to take some time out here. We're just going to try something different. And this young woman continued. She said, we were really nervous. She said, they don't get along very well. We thought if they're going to be in a car for six months, they're going to kill each other. And so I said, how did it turn out? And she said, it was really awesome. They went here. They went there. They sent postcards. They died. They came back after six months and got an apartment and started a new lives and much happier and whatever. And she said... I hope I can do that when I get to their age. And that's the click. That's the, that's what we want younger people to say about us. I hope we can do that when we get to be your age. That's part of our legacy. Yeah. yeah, That's our legacy. And that's part of our swagger and our legacy. (laughs) And I think what a great contribution we can make to, to society and younger generations. I think that I love that story. I think it's terrific. I'm yeah. noticing the time. I just, one other thing from Bill that I just wanted to uh, repeat again that the organization I had mentioned, it's actually www.saging, S A G E hyphen I N G guild dot org. And it's the international saging, but it's saging with a hyphen. Um, guild.org. So anyway, I just wanted to respond to that. Maybe we have time. If there's any other, I think I'm up to date on the questions. And so I think of, unless somebody has a last minute one to give, and I want to thank you, Abby, so much for, I think, just a terrific conversation. And I just wonder if there are a couple of other uh, comments or takeaways. How do you feel people are faring? Thanks for all the problems that come up and aging, which we know about, I think that people are doing, by and large, very well. That, But it, it makes me, I came away being really inspired by the resilience, creativity, and generosity of most people. When we look at the news, we tend to think the world's just going the wrong way. But I, and going around and talking to people who are in this stage and working out their lives and making decisions, confronting the, confronting death, confronting illness, confronting losses, and also moving into the, this period of making a legacy, figuring, as they say, instead of getting ahead, you get whole. But mm-hmm. figuring out this period, I think, is very exciting. And I think we should be proud of ourselves. Social revolutions are hard. And I think we're doing very well. There was a UN study that came out recently <clears throat> that said that the United States was one of the best places to be in your older decades. Hmm. We don't do too well on international. And the other thing is that compared to other industrialized countries, we have the longest life expectancy at age 65. Mm -hmm. We are doing some things that are right. 
Well, that is important to keep in perspective. But I do really like your notion about needing to think very consciously and intentionally about how we really are a pioneer generation and there that we do have, in a sense, an obligation to think more intentionally about the legacy we're leaving to the the younger generation. Absolutely. We really do. Uh, We just happen to be the pioneer generation. And this explains, first, how difficult it is and how sometimes Mm -hmm. we get troubled and stuck and we don't know where we're going and it's frightening and life gets out of control. And that when we have to remind ourselves, hey, it's not just me, it's just our whole generation, this is new, and no one's really figured it completely out. That's the first thing. But second thing is, this is such a gift and an opportunity, and just think to be the generation that sort of sets the first standards, in a way, of this new territory, the new path Mm -hmm. on this new territory, is very exciting. It's not only a big responsibility, but it's a wonderful opportunity to take our and values a, 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 and leave yeah. them to, to future generations. And, and to not be afraid, I think, to take risks. That's the other thing oh, yes. you talk yes. about, that that's so important. That's the if not now, when. You know, right. What, take some risks. And I'm able to like, write a memoir, paint a picture, go do, push yourself, push mm-hmm. yourself. And that I think that's very exciting. And also I would say I'm like my career is being a hard bitten journalist and I have to say I've turned into a total love mush in that <laughs> I just think that what happens when you open yourself up and care for other people and love others, in a sense it's a very rich world. And it doesn't depend on merit or achievement or all the usual benchmarks of success. It just depends on caring for someone else. And that there's some magic in that. And I think that's, and I think it'd be something good for us to show younger people the importance of really caring for other people, loving other people, and being a good friend and laughing a lot. That sounds like a, a wonderful place to, to end this really wonderful interview. So I want to thank you so much for being with us today, Abby, and sharing your wisdom and insights and perspective of what we all are bringing to and have to give, I think, as we get older. Thank you. Thank you so much. As you can see, I love talking about this, and I believe (laughs) that this is a great new chapter for us. And I want to encourage everybody, if you haven't yet had the opportunity to uh, read uh, Abby's books, that one is My Time and the other is Crazy Times, and they're both available on Amazon, so I would encourage you to, to pick up a copy and read. Take care. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.